people between the ages of 13 and 25 who are living in their mom's basement, existing off Uber Eats, never leaving their homes, and all of a sudden, they're instant millionaires. On the 15th of July, 2020, a 17-year-old infiltrated Twitter, posting a Bitcoin doubling scam to the accounts of numerous celebrities. Being called the biggest security incident in Twitter's history. Former President Barack Obama, Tesla founder Elon Musk, even Microsoft's Bill Gates. It netted him $117,000. Pennies to a teen who, at the time of his arrest, was found with three million more. Ah, and when I I did some digging, I found that he has a long history of internet fraud and extortion. So today, I'm going to tell you the untold story of Graham, how he went from stealing thousands on Minecraft, to robbing millions from CEO hedge fund types, to getting involved in a homicide, and eventually getting greedy and hacking Twitter, all before he was 18. This is going to be a wild ride into the seedier sides of the internet, so buckle up. I don't scam shit, dude. Your channel's literal shit. You get zero views. I'm basically your fucking channel, dude. Might as well say open makes MC vids. Come on now. They work together and they scam, uh, like my gun capes. Like they sell my gun capes and it's a scam. I made 5k in the past month off of Minecraft. I know you're a DDoSing. F I didn't hit him off. You f hit him off. It's not your first time DDoSing someone. I, I only believed it because of, um, his YouTube channel because he has subs, but it's actually ridiculous some of the stuff that Graham got up to in 2016 when he was just 14 years old. But most of all, I found that this era of his life really highlights something important about his personality. See, Graham was running what was a rather large YouTube channel for the niche that he was in. He was doing videos on a Minecraft game mode known as Hardcore Factions, and in his videos, he was extremely charismatic and charming. But underneath this act, he was really leveraging and taking advantage of his audience to scam them for money. And worst of all, when exposed, he would show zero regard for right and wrong. He literally didn't care what other people thought of him. Look, what we're about to explore on the surface is just the shenanigans of a young teenager. But what it helps us understand is how he was able to make a seemingly small leap out of this world into committing his later, much more serious crimes. Before any of the scams, what influenced Graham to arrive at this point in his life? Well, very little is known about his childhood, other than that he was raised by his mom, a single parent. As you've seen already, he certainly appears to have been a troubled youth, perhaps at risk to get involved in any sort of crime, but I would bet money on hardcore factions being his first introduction to the dark side of internet fraud and extortion. There's a lot of context here, so let me explain. See, this game mode was originally devised and hosted by Shopo Network. It was a twist on the already notoriously toxic game mode, Factions PvP. At its core, players formed teams, aka factions, they would build bases to store their loot, and they would fight members of other factions with the hopes of beating them so they could raid their bases for the riches and bragging rights. This new hardcore version had a couple of twists that really pitted players against each other. The most intense of these changes is that, if you were killed, you would be banned from the server for the duration of your playtime. And this gave players time to stew, often coming up with a plan for revenge, even if it meant taking it outside of the game. During this era, Minecraft cheating clients were becoming extremely popular due to griefing teams on YouTube glamorizing their destructive nature. And Hardcore Factions was no exception to this. With the stakes so high, it was almost irresistible. Extraing was one thing, but the real power was in the PvP cheats. Players were almost forced into it to remain competitive. Now, that said, I don't think the actual cheating was the worst part. No, the worst part was the culture around these clients. See, hardcore faction players were known for DDoSing, account hijacking, and even swatting. 
The hack client culture had permeated into these servers. There was, and still is, an overlap between Minecraft cheating and actual hacking communities. You know, I remember the Nautis forum. I was a young teen then myself, and that place was literally my first introduction into the world of booters, dump databases, credential stuffing, remote administration tools, you name it. They were using all those techniques there to procure hacked Minecraft accounts. On Hardcore Factions, people were literally purchasing and selling stolen accounts known as alts for a few pennies each to continue playing during that period after death. But for some, like Graham, they would end up exploring these techniques outside of the context of Minecraft. It was like a stepping stone, because these same techniques could be applied to get into any type of online accounts. Banks, social media, crypto exchanges, you name it. Alright, we go. Open you a beach. Scamming piece of shit, say you make 5k a month, that's bullshit. Scamming kids for $30, hit a bitch up, you can get a holla man, shut the fuck up. Now, of course, just being involved in these communities, Graham didn't immediately break into high level social engineering overnight. There was a series of events that seemed to have led Graham down that path, each step of the way less innocent than the one before. And you know it's bad when someone makes a six minute long diss track chronicling all that you've done wrong. Say you care about your fans, man, you don't give a fuck. Scamming, doxing, dosing, faking, boy, where does it end? See, Graham first broke bad between 2016 and 2017 on his YouTube channel where he mainly posted trapping videos. Those are clever ways to kill other players in hardcore factions. And he did all this under his Minecraft name, OpenHFC, and later just Open. That username is important, by the way, and very telling, but we'll get back to it shortly. Now, instead of finding legitimate ways to monetize his niche internet micro-celebrity fame, instead, he turned to devising little scams to rip off his audience, often with an accomplice. Open was with Feed. Feed is pretty much Open's uh, scamming buddy. Though, when you watch some of these, you really get the idea that Graham was the one leading the entire thing. Uh, the deal was I'd give him $50 and a shout out for a Minecon cake. I'll give you the link first. All right, that's the redeem. That goes to a website, blaze.tk. <laughs> he says that he's looking for server trailers to upload. Do not work with this guy. He charges like $200 a trailer and then he doesn't even upload them. He just runs away with your money. Made a fake giveaway. Yeah, and you already admitted it was fake, so don't even try and play like it, it wasn't. wasn't a fake giveaway. I just didn't give the shit to the winner. Exactly. And I don't care. No matter how many exposing videos came out, his audience didn't really seem to care or even dwindle. He was still growing. And when he did catch flack, he'd just try to talk his way out of it. DDoSing attempt to work. Okay. I, can, I can't tell, have okay. an MC resolver on, of a staff member? Let me member? ask you this. Why would you want a staff member's IP? Just tell me. Who said why I wanted his IP? Well, why are you searching on MC resolver then? Who said that? What if I want to see a skin? And when someone pinned him, he'd brag about it. Track, are you staff? I was staff when I need you, yeah. So if I say fuck you, is that staff disrespect? Not really, I don't care, because you're like 12. I'm like 12, but I make more money than you. You want me to show you my paper? Sure, man, sure. Do you think I'm kidding? Why are you trying to hide my card about your PayPal? Past... It's I like made 1K, 5K in the past month off Minecraft. Hey, dude. Good for you. That's good for you. Off Minecraft. Keep in mind, these are all pretty much YouTubers that he scammed. You can imagine the amount of other people he scammed with no following to expose him to. Nothing about his channel was honest, even the trapping videos were exposed to be fake. One of Open's friends recorded Open faking his clips and planning it out- I like swear, Pastor, you're gonna be like the type to make an expose video on this bitch. If anything though, having so many people help him make these videos really illustrates something about Graham. He was good at getting people to do what he wanted. In fact, at some point Graham decided to open a Minecraft server called Fuse PvP, but he lacked the technical talent to do it. But to compensate, he talked his way into getting other people to set it up for him. Like this is literally setting up your server, I don't know why you're complaining about it. Oh, you guys pay $10 for that? I'll give you $10 for the clip, and then we'll set up your damn server, yes. And when they wouldn't do it for free, he would try scamming them. All you need to do is give me your work. The plugins. About the plugin, sent it to him in a file, and as soon as we sent it, he said thanks, bitches, and then he spammed John Cena like soundboards and everything like that, and then he left. I don't play with your crap, bro. You mess with me, you mess with my boy. You know, you wanna know who my boy is? My boy John Cena. He even scammed other YouTubers into promoting it. This is the description and shit that he wants you to put for a trailer 
basically a trailer. His talent was in manipulation, not technology, and he didn't seem to want to pay for anything, no matter how little the cost. He was greedy, and this is foreshadowing. Now, there's one last aspect from this time in Graham's life that we've yet to examine. His username, Open. It's pretty nice, right? Well, he likely purchased it for a few hundred dollars off somebody who stole it. See, there is a whole market for unique usernames like this, be it for Instagram, Twitter, Minecraft, you name it. And worse, there's a group of people who are acutely aware of this and have made careers out of obtaining these names for sale by any means possible. The most notorious form for this is OG users. It's a known marketplace where these types of usually stolen social media accounts are traded. While of course they don't openly advertise or condone the illegal side of how members obtain these accounts, some of the worst stories of targeted harassment and extortion that I've ever heard of were committed by members of this forum. And by 2016, Graham had set up an account to buy and sell usernames here. But it wasn't until 2018 that he really got involved, basically right at the end of his Minecraft scamming days. Hardcore Factions was falling out of popularity, and so this was a natural transition given that the communities are somewhat linked already and Graham has a proclivity for making bad decisions in the pursuit of money. You've got to understand, a good name like at Panda on Twitter will go for thousands of dollars. There's serious money in hacking them and the members of this forum have varying levels of experience. Of course, the vast majority have no idea what they're doing, but at the very top you have a handful of folks that are versed in blackmail, doxing, phishing, sim swapping, to name a few of the techniques that they use to take over accounts. And Graham, being a social butterfly, was getting himself involved with that more experienced crowd. And then Graham, one of the alias Graham, which was probably um, early 2018, all the people knew him as the Minecraft guy. He used to just scam people all the time. And then um, he started like hacking people. He was um, a sim swapper. I got a notice from the Secret Service. When they finally captured Graham, they made it known to me that there was probably some recovery that was available to me. Exactly one year before the Twitter hack on April 15th, 2019, tech investor Greg Bennett was having a little afternoon business chat with his son when his mobile phone dropped signal. It absolutely goes dead. There's no cell signal, no nothing. I can't get into my email accounts either. He was the target of a SIM swap attack. I immediately called up AT&T and they say, sorry, sir, that's not your account. All my crypto accounts have been hacked. And think about how easy this is. If somebody takes over your phone, all these folks have to do is use your email address to try to log on to these accounts and then say, forgot password. So then the, the password reset is sent to your text, which is now controlled by another phone that you don't have. And they reset the passwords and now they have complete control over getting into all of your crypto accounts. This type of attack was becoming more and more common. While it was originally devised to break into social media accounts to steal their rare usernames, perpetrators on OG users quickly realized that they could use the same techniques to break into the accounts of large crypto holders. The way Graham used to find his target, he would go on like the Twitter accounts of Coinbase, Bittrex, Binance, and he'd see who looked rich, who didn't, you know, who flexed, who didn't, who looked uh, more wealthy. Once Graham and never identified accomplices targeted Greg, they would have doxed him to get his phone number and email addresses and then use that information to execute the SIM swap. In total, they got away with what amounted to be 164 bitcoins. A hundred of that was straight bitcoin and the other 64 was various altcoins. At the time, that was worth $856,000, but in today's value, it would be worth $6.3 So what the heck does he do with it? He balls out. According to the Times, Graham was attracting attention at school because he seemed to have an unusual amount of wealth for his age. He was buying designer clothes, apparently flashing large amounts of cash, and of course he had that BMW 3 Series. But where he was really showing off was on his Instagram account at Air. Now, unfortunately, this account has since been terminated and most of the content lost the time. But to give you an idea of the type of purchases he was boasting about, one of the things that did survive is this shout out from a jeweler to the hip hop elite showing that Graham had purchased himself a gem encrusted Rolex. 
Jude was spending some mad coin, but I think there's something a little deeper here than him just having been a 17 year old showing off. I mean, this was part of sim swapper culture. People between the ages of 13 and 25 who are living in their mom's basement, existing off Uber Eats, never leaving their homes, and all of a sudden they're instant millionaires. I've been in the kitchen wrist twisting like a trick shot. Most you rappers got no bars like a sim swap. E girls dropping ass. There was idolized members of OG users like Winblow, Xavier, and Joel, who between 2016 and 2019, without any punishment up until then, stole into the tens of millions of dollars by sim swapping, and they were openly living lavish lifestyles because of it. May 50k off extortion. My sweater you couldn't afford it. I mean, Xavier literally purchased a $200,000 McLaren, was stolen crypto, and posted about it on Instagram. Worse, he was publicly sharing videos like this too. Notice the sign spelling out his handle? This was at the Hyde Sunset Club in Los Angeles. That is not a cheap place. And his friend, another sim swapper, Joel Ortez, was there too, posting videos of them dumping out $200 bottles of glow-in-the-dark champagne over designer watches. At least he got this good selfie with those bottles first, because now he's doing a decade in prison at 21 years old for having stolen $7.5 million. I digress, these were all young guys stealing a ton of money, spending it fast and boasting about it and I can totally see how Graham could have idolized these people and perhaps that's why he seemingly followed in their footsteps. Graham and friends actually ran into a problem when stealing from Greg. Because I had a 100 Bitcoin limit in this specific account with Bitrix, they repeatedly try to go back in and take whatever else was left out of that account, but the 100 Bitcoin limit kind of mitigated my losses, if you want to say that. And so, just like the Minecraft days, when one scam isn't working, iterate. In this case, that meant extortion. Graham Clark, who was going by Scrim at that time as his pseudonym, so tried to ransom you from your own email address to regain access to your information for an additional 50 Bitcoin. Was that what they tried to do as well? Yeah. So I, I actually had four email accounts. They uh, had actually hacked all four of them and then gave me access, regave me access to one and used that as a, as a vehicle to try to communicate and extort more from me. But as the days go on and Greg isn't responding to the ransom, it becomes apparent that Graham has pulled a fast one on his accomplices. Graham decided to keep all the money and he didn't split it with the other people. I assume Graham vanished on whatever messaging service they were using because they get desperate and start trying to reach him through Greg's email account, threatening that they're going to turn him into the police if he doesn't share 66% of the theft. Yeah, so I mean, as you know, a lot of people didn't like him because of some of the choices he made. So obviously that's going to come with some backlash. They got his family's personal info. They were just constantly harassing him. Someone sent people to Graham's house to scare him or even rob him at one point. Well, they're planning his robbery. They wanted to have him like tortured, and, like a lot of dark things done to him. The thing is, he was no ghost. After this, he was the subject of a criminal investigation, which ultimately led to a search warrant being executed at his residence in August 2019, just four months after this theft. Get this, from that they seized $15,000 in cash and 400 Bitcoin from Graham. That is a crap ton more than what we knew about. I mean, I assume he was involved in many similar sim swap attacks that were never linked back to him to acquire that, but at this point, I don't think we're ever really gonna know for sure. Now, while Graham was waiting on the outcome of this criminal investigation, which seized his money, according to the Times from interviews with his peers, there's some claims that he got involved with selling drugs. Everything from vapes to weed to LSD. And over Christmas break, January 4th, 2020 now, this got him involved in a home invasion in which one of his friends ended up dead. Two people were shot, one of them dead after an apparent home invasion in Citrus Park. The other is in critical condition. It happened at the Seasons at West Chase Apartment Complex on the 12,000 block of Citrus Falls Circle. At about 7.30 p.m., two teens kicked in a screened back patio and let themselves into an apartment through an unlocked door. One of them was carrying a firearm. Both made demands of the residents, a man with his fiance, and that man retrieved a gun and opened fire, hitting both teens, according to the sheriff's office. 
They were rushed to the hospital where one was pronounced dead and the other was listed as in critical condition. When patrol deputies arrived on scene, they located a suspicious vehicle with two more teenagers inside. One of those teenagers was Graham. From the police file, one of the kids claims that Graham had essentially set them up. He went with them to the house of another drug dealer with a gun and then took off when he heard the shots. In his interview with police, Graham denies anything about it. You say, I don't know anything about it. I'm not aware, that's why I gave them money. If they were gonna go rob someone, why would I give them money? Is that believable? What's believable? What you're telling us. I counted 5,500. I gave it to them. They walk and they go to the thing. So what makes you think I know that they're going to go rob someone? From the police reports, they concluded that there's no proof of what Graham's actual role was. The only thing they knew for sure was that he was outside in the car when the shooting took place. There wasn't enough evidence to convict him, and so he went free. Two days after the shooting, and one day before students returned after Christmas break, the principal sent out an email saying those who were involved in the shooting face serious charges and will not be returning. And so this was the end of Graham going to high school, and it's at this point with his world crumbling around him that he decides to move out on his own. And this was possible because the feds let him off real easy on the sim swap case. It's appropriate to assume that every single penny that this defendant has access to is by ill-gotten gains. After an eight-month-long investigation, all the charges against Graham were dropped. He kind of like said that they came to an agreement where he had to give up blah 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 amount of funds, and once doing so, they drop all the charges on him. Out of all of that money seized, they only made him give up a hundred bitcoins. They essentially were after him for the theft of a million dollars. When they raided his apartment, they found three million more on top of that, and they let him walk free with that money as long as he paid back what they knew he had stolen. Our office spoke with the prosecutors in California about the decision to have him uh, pay restitution and basically not to criminally charge him as an adult. It seems that the main reason for this outcome is because there is a lot of barriers to charging a minor with a crime, especially at the federal level. The law may need to be changed to allow the federal system to catch up with the reality that you have younger kids getting involved in online scams, crypto scams, that really merit more serious prosecution and punishment which federal law doesn't currently allow. I mean, he was thankful, obviously. It could have went a bad way. He wanted to like move forward and like invest all the money he's made over the years into like a legitimate business. He wanted to work on being a better person in general and like moving on to more legit things. But I think the real lesson Graham took away from this is that as long as he's a minor, he can steal all this money and get away with it. Because two months after April 2020, when he got back 75% of his seized assets, he went on to hack Twitter. And this is important because Graham's birthday is in January. He had less than eight months before he turned 18. We're watching this story. Several high profile Twitter accounts appear to have been hacked. It's being called the biggest security incident in Twitter's history. It's all part of a Bitcoin scam. Former President Barack Obama, Tesla founder Elon Musk, even Microsoft's Bill Gates, just some of the big names targeted by con artists. Over 250 transactions have already been sent to that Bitcoin address. July 15th, 2020. Twitter erupts into chaos and everybody is desperately trying to find out how this happened and who is behind it. The search goes back to these two OG user members, who both have made threads literally less than 24 hours before, offering to sell any username you want for a few thousand dollars. This was godlike access, the stuff of fairy tales within these circles. And so Hasib Awan, founder of a SimSwap protection service, picks up that these two obviously have access to some huge breach to be able to offer this service, and so he posts a screenshot of the thread showing it as a possible lead as to who is behind the attack. And Chewan freaks out. He messages Hasib and says, please remove this. I am not the bad guy. I don't want to get in trouble here. I'm just a broker. I had no involvement in the hack and it's freaking me out. 
he was just trying to prove that hey, I'm just a middleman. I actually didn't do anything. Turns out this was a 19 year old from the United Kingdom, Mason Shepard, and he was very scared about what his implication in all of this was going to be. And Hasib having the foresight that this guy is likely going to be arrested within 24 hours suggested that he talks to a journalist right away to set his side of the story straight. It turns out that he had been contacted along with another OG user member, Nima Fazeli, aka Rolex by this mysterious Discord alias Kirk claiming that they work for Twitter and they can get any username. Neither of the soon-to-be accomplices believe it. Scams run rampant within these communities and so they both say, prove it. And Kirk does. He proceeds to give them both access to rare handles along with sharing pictures of Twitter's internal tools. To quote Rolex's response, damn, I'm in. And so this is when the sales threads went up. And over the next few hours, before Joe Biden, before Elon Musk, all of these rare, non-celebrity accounts are being taken over. In total, they brokered the sale of $40,000 worth of rare usernames, of which 33,000 went to Kirk, and the rest was kept by the now accomplices as a brokerage fee. Nighttime, now in the UK, and real happy about having just made a few grand, Mason goes to bed. He even shared a picture with the Times of him saying goodnight to his girlfriend before it all went to hell to prove he wasn't behind it. Unfortunately for Mason, I don't think he fully understood what his involvement in this meant for his future. Tonight, the FBI is leading a new investigation into the most high-profile hack in Twitter history. Almost immediately, the public knew it all started on OG users. But as the days rolled on after the attack, the answer to the biggest question of all was starting to come to light. Who is Kirk and how did they get access to Twitter's admin tools? This takes us back to May 2020. It was literally only a factor of days after Graham wrapped up his case with the Secret Service that him and another kid started work on getting into Twitter. What's really remarkable is his accomplice was actually two years younger, just 15, but much more sophisticated than Graham. And according to investigators, the two had previously worked together on sim swap scams. Being so young, this guy was never publicly charged, and so much about him remains a mystery, but we do know he was a member of OG users since age 13, and prior to this, he was actually involved in hacking GoDaddy. By this time, sim swapping was becoming harder than ever. With so many high profile cases, crypto trading platforms were making the move to non SMS based two factor authentication. And so these two took the same set of skills, but applied them to a new target. The self employed attorney, not a fan of working from home, but two months after sheltering in place, Twitter is making the idea a permanent option for some. This was just months after COVID hit the West. Amidst the massive shift to working from home, companies were rushing to deploy systems, allowing their employees to remote in. But this wasn't a perfect storm. The two realized this and got to work on abusing it. At first, casting a massive net, they started by compiling a list of Twitter employees on LinkedIn and used job recruiter tools to obtain their phone numbers. From here, they used the same skills required for those SIM swap attacks. Really, it was about being convincing on the phone, calling employees pretending to be from the IT department. Hey, we've got a problem with your account. I need you to log into this portal for me. Except it was a phishing page. The employee would enter their username and password and that would be stolen. From this, they were able to get into Twitter's internal Slack channels and start piecing together who had access to the admin tools that they were really after. The net was getting smaller, and they tailored the attack to target this group specifically. And on July 14th, one fell victim. Graham and his accomplice were in. They now had access to every Twitter account and they could take them over with the click of a button. So starting at three in the morning, the two start taking over these rare usernames and selling them under the alias Kirk. But by afternoon, 2 p.m., the gig is up. Word has spread that this isn't a real Twitter rep and nobody wants to buy anymore because the chances of these names getting reset once the hacker is discovered is far too risky. The pair know this. Taking over so many high profile accounts is going to draw attention. They don't have long on this admin account, so unable to profit from usernames, what do they do now? There's much bigger implications than some Bitcoins being tossed around on the internet. Basically could have had every DM on every account for every celebrity within like an hour. Because that sold Intel to Russia or China but imagine it on election day. Potentially start World War III. They could have launched a nuclear war. 
Uh, not exactly, but they could have killed Apple stock and made a bet on it and made millions of dollars. I think uh, we got lucky here. Out of all of the things they could have done, they ran a doubling money scam. I would have expected this from an 11 year old in 2008 on RuneScape, but not from these two. Could have done anything, honestly, and you would have made more money. Those teenagers at the end of the day, so. You know, from all of this, they only received $118,000 worth of crypto. It actually would have been a lot more, but the big crypto exchanges pretty quickly put that address on their blacklist. Coinbase alone stopped an additional $280,000 from being sent. I think we're starting to get the picture here that these two were more savvy than smart. Get back to the beat, gotta drop some bars. Got enough proof to put you behind bars. Yeah. Anytime we see any type of criminal involved in multiple activities, you always look back to see, should we have known more at the time? But we have to rely on the investigations we have. And here we're able to now hold him responsible for a crime that we can prove he committed. It only took the FBI two weeks. Unfortunately for us, Graham's file is mostly redacted due to him having been a minor, so it's not clear how he was caught. But as for Mason and Nima, their fatal flaw was having their IDs attached to the crypto exchanges they were using to receive Bitcoin from the sale of those stolen usernames. It makes me sad to see these two young men face such harsh, complicated, and uncertain futures because really they were used by Graham and then media took advantage of them, convinced them that their best play was to come clean about their involvement with a crime so as to make their non-involvement clear. And as we've seen, Mason was particularly vulnerable. These were the first two individuals known related to the Twitter hack because of those articles and it made it really easy for readers to lump these youth in with the real criminals, that is Graham and his accomplice. First one up on the docket this morning, Graham Ivan Clark. Case 20 CF 879. So just a couple days after his arrest, the case is already moving forward by means of the Zoom call with the judge and a couple of the attorneys. Um, Mr. White, Good morning, it's Mr. Mike, Mike Oxmo, representing these. And by now, word had gotten back to OG users, and they were freaking out. They thought their form was going to get shut down. But one thing OG user members are known for is trolling, be it random people online, be it Zoom calls with judges. And so a bunch of them joined this posing as news agencies. I was just wondering if you're going to like uh, take Updog into consideration in the Graham case. Sorry, I'm, I'm removing people as quickly as I can. And it's like things are getting worse and worse. <laughs> And then finally, someone manages to take over the screen and they start playing this pornography. Uh, as, as was pointed out to the duty judge, why, why would... Uh, we'll um, just re, re, reapply, I'm going to end this, reapply to... to, to oh my God, oh my God. Okay. This just reminds me of Call of Duty lobbies. It's a stark reminder that for most of these people, they're teenagers. And for someone like Graham, they gave him second chances. They gave him opportunities to turn his life around and do the right thing. And so what do you do with him now? All new at six, a Tampa teen accused of running a Twitter hack on some of the most famous people in our nation made his first appearance in court today. Hillsborough State Attorney Andrew Warren filing 30 felony charges against 17-year-old Graham Clark. Graham was being charged as an adult and faced up to 210 years in prison. On top of this, his assets became a hot topic. Clark was the subject of an earlier investigation that ended in April, in which his defense attorney says he had around $3 million worth of Bitcoin. The FDLE alleges Clark used some of that money to set up infrastructure for this Twitter hack. They put a $750,000 bond on Graham and prosecutors requested that he be forced to prove any funds used to post bail were legitimately obtained. They didn't want him using that Bitcoin. 
The judge granting that wish. Graham ended up sitting in prison for seven and a half months before eventually entering into a plea deal. Hey, Mr. Clark, do you understand that those are the facts you're pleading guilty to? Yes. Clark's six total years of punishment are the maximum allowed under Florida's youthful offender law. That youthful offender status is available only once in a person's life. It means Clark will be held in a juvenile facility and he'll get education and transition services, which will prepare him for a productive life after he serves his time. And he knows if he violates his probation, he'll face a 10 year sentence in adult prison. Some might say that Graham got off easy, especially when you consider he'll eventually be coming home to that 300 Bitcoin which has appreciated astronomically in value. As of today, it's worth $12 million. In this case, we've been able to achieve justice, deliver those consequences, while recognizing that our goal with any child, whenever possible, is to hold them accountable and have them learn their lesson without destroying their future. There's this idea that one's online identity is strikingly more raw because with a level of anonymity, you lose the barriers of social mores, constructs, and trepidations. And so one can act more in accordance with their true self, do what they might otherwise not. It was more about, I was more concerned about the just loss of identity. And so it makes it very easy for someone with a low moral compass to commit these kinds of attacks on the foundation of the internet especially kids because their morals are undeveloped, especially when they get involved with groups like the ones Graham found himself in. I found many of these groups will treat their fraud like some sort of legitimate business. They're boasting about it and they receive praise from other scammers. And so it creates this social group where everybody is accepting of the wrongdoing and I think this helps them feel like they're not a menace to society and in fact, even like they're achieving something. Having a friend group doing the same thing normalizes it. And I think that is a very dangerous situation to find yourself in, especially if you're someone who is a recluse. You maybe don't have any friends in real life, and so this becomes your primary only social group. How are you going to get out of that? It's um, almost like an addiction for them to just keep making money to the point where they don't care anymore. And no one online has empathy. Um, for the majority, everyone's a sociopath. To scam is to not add any value to society, which is a real problem when it comes to sustainability. You know, for the narcissist, maybe the convincing argument is, if you want long-term profitability, being destructive is not the way to achieve that. Instead, focus on creating something that provides value, something you can share outside of that friend group, something that doesn't hurt your fellow humans. Since I, since I was a kid, I've always been, like, since I was, like, 10 years old, I just always was into money. So I've always started making money. I got into social media. I made, like, a few hundred thousand dollars. And then I started getting into, like, cryptocurrency and trading, and then it got into millions. But I didn't plan on none of that. 